Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another DxO webinar. I'm your host, Photo Joseph. And if this is your first webinar with me, welcome. Uh, lovely to see you here today. And if we just get a quick little shout out in the chat room, I want to make sure that everybody can see and hear me. You should be seeing and hearing me and seeing my screen right now as well. Um, also, everybody's saying all good. Excellent. Thank you. Also, if there's a lot of background noise today, um, let me know if you can hear this. I apologize. Apparently, a 747 landed on my roof today, and they're currently unloading a herd of elephants. That's at least what it sounds like up there. I don't know what's happening on my roof today, but um, but it's loud. So hopefully, this isn't coming through to you guys. And uh, let's see here. Uh, housekeeping. Um, first of all, if this is your first webinar with me, I do my best to answer questions as we go. So as you come up with questions, feel free to ask them. If you think I might be on my way to answering it, then maybe hold off on the question. But for the most part, I will do my best to answer these as we go. Today's webinar is going to be a little bit different than uh, previous sessions that we've done just because of the nature of the tool, but I will still be checking in with the questions as much as possible. Also, I am your host, Photo Joseph. If I didn't say that already, I am sending you right now a series of links. This is me all over the everywheres on the socials, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. And not only would I appreciate a follow everywhere there, but most importantly, if you have any questions about what you see today that you don't get to get asked, or you don't get to ask, or you don't get answered in the Q&A, by all means, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. That's probably the best route for that. And I will do my best to get your question answered for you. Um, let's see here. I do believe uh, that is everything I wanted to do there. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, let's just get started on this thing, shall we? So we're talking about Sharpener Pro today. And when I said that this is gonna be a bit different than usual, my normal flow here is to open up pretty pictures, uh, well, at least I think they're pretty, and modify them, enhance them, do things with them. We are gonna do that at the very end, but that really isn't what today's session is about. Today's session is really about understanding the fundamentals and kind of way beyond the fundamentals of what the sharpening tools do. And you're gonna learn a lot today about sharpening itself. Sharpening is kind of a, I don't wanna call it like a black art or anything, but it's it's definitely confusing. And if you don't know what's happening, then a lot of times, and I think what a lot of people do is they just wiggle the sliders back and forth until they get something and go, I guess that's okay. It looks sharper and off they go. So I'm going to aim today to provide some education on what sharpening is and how it works. And this is very specifically to this tool, but when I, after I show you what, I've, what I'm showing you today, you will be able to open any sharpener and using some of the same techniques that I do, kind of get a better understanding of what is actually happening in there. Um, so with that all said, we're going to start with a photo that's already been enhanced, already treated. This is a TIFF file right here. If I hover over it, we'll see if there it says it's a TIFF. And I would right click on this and open this in. And there are two different sharpening tools in here. There is the raw sharpener, which would better be called a pre-sharpener, and then there's the output sharpener. We're actually not going to use the raw sharpener at all, and let me explain why, and and you'll understand why you'll unlikely you're unlikely to ever use it. Um, first of all, the name raw sharpener, <laughs> elephants. The name raw sharpener is a bit misleading. It is not a raw photo sharpener. It's by raw, I think what they meant when they first created this thing like 10 plus years ago was an untouched file, kind of the raw file, but not raw in the sense of it's a digital raw photograph. So forget the fact that it says raw, let's just call it a pre-sharpener. Back in the day when cameras didn't do that good of sharpening in the software, and especially if you were shooting JPEG in camera, the sharpening might've been too much, like kind of overbearing or not very good at all or whatever, just the sharpening in cameras didn't used to be very good. And so this software allowed you to take a photo from the camera, a JPEG, and sharpen it and do the sharpening that you wanted to do before you did any other creative work and before you did your final output sharpening. So the idea behind this, this workflow would be you would take a JPEG shot in camera with sharpening disabled in camera. So you would even say, All right, the sharpening of my camera kind of sucks. I'm going to go and turn it off or turn it all the way down, shoot your JPEGs, bring them into the raw sharpener, the pre-sharpener do a basic level of sharpening, do all of your enhancement that you're gonna do, whatever creative effects you're doing, and then do the final stage, which was the output sharpening. That was kind of the idea behind the workflow. But today, first of all, cameras do incredibly good sharpening in camera, but more importantly, we're pretty much all shooting raw these days. And if you're shooting raw, then the raw decode process has sharpening built into it. And that process is gonna be better than what you were, would be able to do here. And you can't decode, it. well, I guess you could decode a raw file and turn off the sharpening. I suppose that's possible, at least turn it all the way down. But 
don't. It just just don't. So for now, just ignore this tool. Pretend it doesn't exist because we're not going to use it. What we are going to use is the output sharpener. Now, the output sharpener is a final stage of your process. So when you're done with all of your creative work and you are ready to print it or upload it or whatever it is you're going to do with it, this is the final stage and this is where we're going to be spending our time today. So uh, because this is a TIFF file, I'm just going to go ahead and say edit the original, edit that, and let's start off with a brief tour of the tool. Alrighty, uh, let's see here. So we're already zoomed into 100%. We'll actually start here. You got your little zoom just like you have always had in these. So zoom out, zoom in. I'm going to go ahead and let it stay zoomed in at 100%. Um, and then your other tools here, your arrow, as we've seen before, for selecting things. In this case, it would be selecting control points. Sounds like they're climbing off the ladder. Let's hope that's the end of that. Um, a hand tool for moving, but of course, if you've got the arrow selected, you can hold down the space bar and get your hand panning tool. And then if you are looking at the edge, let's zoom out of this. Um, I don't think I've ever actually shown this before, although you would pretty quickly figure this out. This little light bulb just changes the tonality of the background. So we'll go for a kind of a middle gray in there. Okay, let's head over to here. I'm gonna actually zoom back into 100%. That's where we're gonna spend most of our time in here. And up here in the top left corner, we have our views. You've got a standard single image view what we've got right now, a split screen view that allows you to see a before and after, and you can move the split screen or you can spin the splitter to be horizontal or vertical. Or what I think is most useful for this particular tool is the side-by-side -side view. So if I do a side-by-side -side view here, then we can very clearly see the original versus the sharpened version here. And you might've noticed that it is already sharpened. By default, sharpening is being applied to this. Uh, you actually can't kind of turn everything completely off and well, I suppose you could dial everything to zero. But anyway, the whole point in here is to sharpen. It starts off with the basic sharpening already applied, which is why we see something different on the right than we do on the left. Okay, so that's that. And then if you wanted to, when you're in the regular view, you could turn the preview on and off. That's another way to get a full screen view of this. Now, here's a a bit of an oddity and a caveat to working with this tool as it exists today. This tool was designed originally long before Retina screens existed, Retina or high DPI if you're on Windows. If you are working on your screen in a high DPI mode, a Retina mode, so your standard on any Mac sold today, and I know a lot of PCs are shipping now with high DPI um, displays, this interface is going to look very pixelated, very chunky, because it doesn't have high DPI support built into it. And unfortunately, what this means is when we're looking at our image at 100%, we're actually seeing it at 200%. And there's no way to zoom out to 50% to simulate 100%. So we have, the elephants are back, we have some, some uh, complications with working with this accurately. And the reason it really matters in here is because sharpening is something that you really have to do at 100% to see pixel for pixel, pixel in the image to pixel on, uh, sorry, pixel, yeah, pixel in the image to the pixel in your monitor to really truly see what you're getting without any other interpolation. Because if you zoom out, right, if you're on a normal, all normal, uh, all things being normal, if you're looking at a image at one to one pixel for pixel, when you zoom out to 50%, you're actually looking at every fourth pixel, right? So in fact, we wouldn't want to zoom out to 50, we'd want to zoom out to 75%. I think that would be the right math. Anyway, point is, you really need to have it pixel per pixel. And you can't unless you switch your screen into a true pixel per pixel mode. Now, on the Mac, you have limited controls of how you can change your resolution. So if I go into the system preferences, go to displays, um, I have, I'm in the scaled mode here and I can change them here, but I can't get to a full native one. Depending on your system, if you hold down the option key, when you click on this scaled button, it may give you a list, a text list. I'm not going to do that now because I don't want to change the resolution on my screen. Or what you can do on a Mac is there is a tool that you can download from the App Store for free called Display, uh, what is it called? Uh, display Menu that will give you options of the different resolutions that you have, including some you can't normally get to. And on my case, right now I'm working on a 5K iMac, which its native actual pixel for pixel resolution is 5120 by 2880, that's the 5K. If I switch it into this mode, then I will be looking at the interface and the image at one to one pixels. It also slows down a lot. The graphics card, in, at least in my machine, this is a pretty old iMac, is not really designed to run things that way. So it does get a bit chunky, but at least you're seeing it at the native resolution. And also I'm gonna give you, um, go back to my notes over here, my chat. Um, I'm going to paste in another URL 
for that display menu there it is so that shortcut will take you right to it again it's a free app on the app store if you're on pc if your windows machine uh, allows you in the display settings just like in here if it allows you to get to that native resolution great if it doesn't you're gonna have to look for something like i have on the mac sorry i don't have a windows machine around here to check with but getting it into that native resolution is going to be important an important part of previewing it now i'm not going to do that today because you'd be i'd be transmitting 5k resolution to you guys over the internet and that would be a bad experience um, but uh, suffice it to say to get a truly honest view of what you're seeing that's something that you need to do this will get addressed i am sure but that's just the way that it is okay uh, i'm going to jump over to the questions real quick tom jones says after sharpening in post using lightroom and or dxo so nick when exporting from lightroom there are choices for sharpening such as screen web etc should those be used after doing dxo output sharpening no if you do your output sharpening using DxO's sharpener, the Nick sharpener, do not add additional sharpening in Lightroom on export. Definitely don't do that. Great question. I'm glad that you asked that. Super. Okay. So, um, all right. So that's that about viewing things at one-to-one. -one. And so again, you really do want to be working at hundred percent as I am in here. In this particular case, I'm at a lower resolution for the sake of the webinar. Okay, moving on. Modes. You have a sharpened image mode, a sharpening soft proof mode, and then some effect overlays we'll come back to. Basically, the difference here is normal working mode, sharpened image, and then this sharpened, sharpening soft proof. The idea here is that it, it is going to mimic, it's going to scale the image, zoom the image to look like it would print it. So if you were printing a 5x7 or 8x10 or whatever, it would scale it on screen to look like that. And in fact, if you do it, it actually shows you a scale on here of what it would look like. This doesn't seem to work properly though right now. And again, I think it's because of this weird resolution thing. It's not designed for retina displays. I think the fact that it's retina is really confusing things. All it really does is at this point, is just zooms you into 100% and shows you a scale. So I think you probably just can ignore that completely because we're gonna work in 100% for the most part anyway. All right, over to the other side. Over here, we have some presets. So if you've come up with something, there's no presets to start with, but you can add your own. So I can go, um, you know, cool preset and hit that. Now I've got a preset there. And you can update that. So if you make changes to something and you want to update the preset, you can. And of course, you can delete it as well. Underneath that, we have our sharpening. So here's the meat of it. There are two different types of sharpening, global types of sharpening to contend with. You have your output sharpening, which is a final stage of sharpening that's applied to the entire image. And this is designed for a particular type of output, whether it's print or screen, or what type of print and so on. And then underneath that, you have creative sharpening. Creative, you have global sharpening, and then selective, which is done by your control points, which is where some of the real power of this tool comes in, because you can selectively sharpen certain parts of the image, but not others. And that's what, what really makes this thing cool. Um, so we're gonna come into all of that. But that's basically what you've got, your output sharpening, that's a global, and then the creative, which is both global and local. So let's start with the output sharpening. It is by default set to display. This is me. This means that it is sharpening for looking at on a screen. Now, this image that I've loaded up right now is the full resolution image, which nobody is ever going to look at this size on screen. Because even if you uploaded the whole the whole image and someone was looking at the full size, unless they actually zoomed into 100% through some funky web interface, they would never see it at that size. So. I don't remember if I mentioned this in the beginning, but one of the really important things about sharpening is that you sharpen the file as it is going to be output. And what that means is if you are going to print, let's make the, let's make the math easy. Let's say you're gonna print a 10 by 10 inch image at 100 DPI or PPI, 100 pixels, well, no dots in this case, 100 DPI, then you would have a 10, you know, 10 inches, right? At 100 each, so that would be a thousand, 10,000, thousand, wow good on math, pixels wide. So you would export the image at that thousand by a thousand pixels wide first, take that thousand by thousand pixel image and open that into the sharpener. That is a really, really important aspect of this. Now, of course, you're probably not printing at 100 DPI, you're probably printing at like 266 DPI or something, let's say. So let's say you're gonna do eight by 10 at 266 DPI. So you bring up your math and you go eight by 260. So that's 2080 pixels um, in one direction to get your eight. And that is how you get your right size. So you would export that size from Lightroom or Photoshop or wherever you are at that correct size, at that resolution. So you dial in the resolution on an export and then bring that back into Lightroom, Photoshop, whatever, and open it up into the sharpener to do your sharpening work. And if you're going to do another print at a different size, you go back to your source, 
export out a new size. If you're going to upload to Instagram, you would export out an image that is 1080 pixels wide because that's the maximum width in Instagram. Bring that TIFF file, export it as a TIFF, so it's totally lossless. Bring that TIFF file back into Lightroom, Photoshop, whatever you are. Open that up and do your creative sharpening there. That is the only way to truly get what you are, what, to truly see what your output is going to be. So that's a very, very important part of this. So for the sake of this, I've opened up the full thing. This is the full image resolution, but you know, it is what it is. Okay. So with that all said, now we look over here at the options. You've got um, display, which is screen, and then you have different types of printer, inkjet, continuous tone, half tone, and a hybrid device. So you have four different printer types that are recognized here. So unless you're printing at home or in your studio, then you are probably shipping it off to somewhere to get printed, in which case you talk to the printer. You say, hey, you know, whatever photo lab, tell me what type of printer I'm printing on and tell me other information like the resolution of the printer, um, what type of paper you're printing on. Of course, that's probably your choice, um, but all of these things matter. So let's say inkjet. I, I will just choose for inkjet here. The first option under inkjet is viewing distance. Look at how precise this is. Auto is kind of a general, but let's say up to, I've switched it over to centimeters. Oh, well, um, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to switch my preferences back real quick to inches. because I think I have mostly a US audience today. If not, I apologize. Um, here we go. So up to two feet away, two to five feet away, four to eight foot, six to 10 foot or 10 plus foot away. And you think, well, how am I supposed to know how people are going to be looking at my image? Well, if you don't really know, then choose auto. But the idea here is, well, if you're making a, let's say a 20 by 30 inch print to hang on your wall or hang in a gallery, given where it's going to be hanging, given the size of it, how far away do you expect people to stand to look at it? Are they going to put their nose right up to it? Right. If you're printing a five by seven and putting it up on the wall, they're going to go right up close to it to see. If you're printing a 20 by 30 or 30 by 40 inch image, people are probably going to step back a bit. So how far away are they going to be? If you can make that estimation in here, you can sharpen specifically for that. And it's a subtle difference, but it's a difference. Watch the sharpened version here as I change from, we'll say, I'll start with the two foot. Let's go from two to five. You see that subtle change in there? Four to eight a little bit stronger change. And you see essentially the sharpening is increasing. If you sharpen, let's go all the way to the, ten, to the 10 foot. We can see on here that this looks pretty bad, right? Because we're right up to it. But printed and looked at from 10 feet away, this is gonna look fantastic. So it's very particular on how, on the viewing distance, um, the type of paper you're printing on the type of printer and so on. So you have all these different choices in here. You have your viewing distance, your paper type, textured and fine art, canvas, plain paper, matte, luster, luster glossy, um, print resolution. What is the resolution? This is where I said, talk to the print company, ask them, what is the resolution of the printer? And you can, you have a bunch of presets or you can actually go in here and just type one in. Oh, I found out that my printer is going to be 2000, um, oops, I'll go to, so two, there it is, 2,000 pixels by 2,000 pixels, like 2,000 dots. It'd be a 2,000 dot printer. That's you know, that's what you're pr punching in here. Cool. So you can get all of these settings from your printer in here, and this will help you to create the optimum output for your printer. I'm going to take a quick look at the questions in here, see if there's anything else. Uh, Robert Wayne says, on a Windows machine, what setting is native resolution? I've never seen such a thing. So you would have to know what the actual pixel count is of your display. So forget the software, forget the computer for a second. You bought a display that was, what does it say on the box or say in the manual? Is it 1920 by 1080 pixels? Well, that is native. Is it, if it's a 4K display, then it's 3840 by 2160 pixels. You would look that up in the manual or on the box or you know, whatever, you find it, um, look it up online, figure out what the native pixel resolution is. Every screen from the computer screen to your, to your iPhone, to whatever, they all have a native pixel resolution. That is what you're looking for in those settings. And this is only relevant until the software gets updated to have native um, high DPI support, but that's the way it is now. Great question, thank you very much. Okay, back to this. So we just talked about, um, we talked about how to prep for output sharpening. And again, having your image already sized to the actual printing size or viewing, on, uh, screen on, viewing size on screen is really important. If for some reason you can't do that, you can't scale it before you bring it in the sharpener, there is a simulation tool in here to simulate what it would look like at different prints. It's a, it's a weird thing. It's kind of cool, but honestly, you'll probably never use it, but I'm just going to show it to you because it's here. If you go into the settings under output sharpening settings, the last option here says image size sliders, and the default is do not display, and this is recommended. But if you display these, what happens is you get two new settings in here, image width and image height. Now, this is not going to scale your image. 
all it is going to do is adjust how much sharpening is done. So let's just say I'm going to do a 30 inch wide print. So let's do 30 by or 40 inch tall. Oh, it's 60. Whoops, wrong way. It's landscape. Um, what did I say? 40 inch. There we go. It's a 40 by 30. Close enough. I can go in there and type it. Let's do it exactly. Okay, 40 by 26.6 inch print. That's what I'm going to get. The amount of sharpening is adjusted so that when you hit OK and render out of here, you can then scale that sharpened print to that 40 inch size and the sharpening will be optimized. Clearly, it is better to do your sharpening at the already scaled image, but if for some reason you can't do that, what you could do in here is simulate it for that. I don't think this works in the display mode. I don't yeah, you don't get anything showing up in display mode. It's just for the print. So again, it's a weird setting. You probably don't need it, probably don't want it, um, but it's there. So let me just go ahead and turn that back. These other options in here, we will come back to in a bit. Okay, so that's output sharpening. The next stage is creative sharpening. I'm going to, did I, yeah, I set it back to display. Okay, let's default that. Great. Okay, the next one is creative sharpening. This is the sharpening you do to make the image look better, right? To sharpen it because it needs it, because you feel that it needs it. You want it to be a little sharper, a little softer, whatever the case may be. And you have four different types of sharpening in here. Output sharpening strength, which is your global, it's actually an unsharp mask. You have structure, local contrast, and focus. I am going to open another file in a moment to help explain what all of these are. So we're going to come back to this, but I want to leave you before we come back to that with this thought. Sharpening is a weird word because you're not actually sharpening. There's no sharpening happening. All you're really doing is enhancing the contrast. And by enhancing contrast around a very specific area, specific um, edges, you know, like where it goes from dark to light very quickly, those edges that are there by increasing the contrast around the edges, you increase perceived sharpening. I always like to add the word perceived into it because it's not actually sharper. I mean, sharper is a weird thing. Anyway, it's like you cut your finger on the picture, right? It's, it's all about perceived sharpness, sharpness in the sense of focus. Uh, now, the reason that you may need to sharpen has nothing to do with your photo being out of focus. If the photo is out of focus, that's different. You actually have a focus slider here that will try to compensate for a slightly out of focus picture. I mean, let's not get carried away, but you know, something is slightly out of focus, you kind of compensate for it. That's different than the sharpening that's happening in here. The sharpening that's happening in here is happening because of limitations of your camera sensor. And the best camera sensor in the world is still nowhere near as good as the human eye. The human eye has much, much higher resolution, essentially infinite resolution. I don't know if anybody's really figured that out, but anyway, um, essentially it has much, much higher resolution than any camera sensor. So no matter how um, big this, how good the sensor is, how big it is, how much, how many pixels it has, there will be a point where you exceed the resolution of that sensor. And a really easy way to kind of visualize this in your head is to imagine, remember, like go back in time, 20 plus years to the very first digital consumer digital camera, the quick take, whatever the heck it was called, the Apple quick take. And it shot pictures at a whopping 640 by 480 resolution. Woohoo! So if you took a picture of a person of anything with that and you looked at it, you know, pretty pixely, right? It was really chunky. It was not very smooth. It was not very sharp. If you take a picture of something very, very clear, let's say you have a pure white wall with a black line painted on it, a pure black line with perfect, perfect edges on it a diagonal line on there. With a tiny little 640 by 480 sensor, you stand back and you take a picture of that, you zoom in close, and that black line is not going to be cl clean. It's going to be all chunky, right? It's going to be pixelated because you've exceeded the resolution limit of the digital sensor. No matter how high resolution it is, you can zoom into any picture, any resolution, and you will eventually get to the point where thin lines, little things like hairs, okay, maybe that's a bad example, hairs, and so on, um, get all jaggy and weird. That's just the right, that's the way it works. That's the way digital works, right? It is a block. Every pixel is a block. It is a block can only be one color. And so as you get into that really fine detail, it has to simulate, it has to do what's called anti-aliasing where you get instead of black and then white, it's black and a shade of gray and then white to kind of show that transition between them. So what the sharpening is doing is enhancing the contrast around those edges. It is not actually sharpening in the sense of, anyway, it's enhancing the contrast. And all of this is going to, be, going to become even more clear momentarily. All right, moving on. So that's creative sharpening. We'll come back to the three different sliders and how they work in a bit. Um, let's move on to selective sharpening. So selective sharpening, we get out of the side-by-side -side mode and zoom out of this. 
Selective sharpening is control point sharpening. So this allows me to assign a different level of sharpening to different parts of the image. Actually, let me just quick, quickly look over at questions before we do this. Um, Irv says, what output resolution for projection? Oh, that's great. So if you are projecting, you would want to make your output resolution, your final size, the native resolution of your presentation. So if you're doing a, a presentation where your, your uh, what do you call it? Your, canvas, your uh, slides are 1920 by 1080, then set the image to be 1920 by 1080. Don't make it higher than that. There's no point to it. You're going to have to scale it down to fit on there. At that point, it's not the resolution of the projector that matters. It's the resolution of the original file. If you've got a real, if you've got a 4K projector, then you should be making a 4K presentation. Do your presentation at 3840 by 2160, and then make all your images at 3840 by 2160. Cool. Nice question. Um, Let's see here. Um, Seraphin says the native resolution is usually tagged as recommended on Windows. Um, yes, unless that display is designed for high DPI. So like my display is a 5K resolution, 50 to whatever the heck pixels long wide, but it is designed for high DPI. So it's optimum resolution, it's recommended resolution is actually half that because every pixel actually takes up four pixels, every pixel of the real world takes up four pixels on screen because it looks sharper. That's what high DPI or retina is in the case of a, a Mac parlance. Uh, Charles Prentice, how do we use sharpening along with Clearview Plus? I don't know, um, I don't use Clearview, sorry. John Kelly, please discuss what Unsharp Mask is. Absolutely, I will get into that momentarily. Tom Jones in Lightroom, how does the use of texture and clarity sliders relate to sharpening? Um, if you use sharpening, should you not apply clarity and texture? Great question, great question. There is no easy answer to that. They are all doing the same thing in different ways. I would say use texture and clarity um, for creative use as you want on the image, but then go into, into here. And I will, if we have time at the end, and I don't know if we will, I will take this image and kind of do it from scratch. The photo you're looking at right now does have some texture or clarity, clarity already applied to it. That is more a visual preference, a visual creative choice. Um, and then the sharpening is kind of that really fine final details. There's no easy answer to that. It's more of what you want and you have to experiment to see what gets the best. But for me, I would usually, my choice would be to do texture and clarity for creative purposes, creative output, and then go to the sharpening. Okay. Uh, so we're in selective now. So we just talked about the creative sharpening sliders here. Selective sharpening gives you all the same sliders, but well, selective. So if I grab a control point and I drop it on the center of this leaf, make that nice and big here, it is going to make a mask around the leaf. Now, just like every other Nick tool, if I click on this little box right here, I see what that mask looks like. Unlike other Nick tools, there is a legacy old feature that has been removed for reasons I will never understand that I have asked DxO, begged DxO, to put back in in the next version of the software. But this particular tool still has the feature where if you hold down the command key on a Mac, and I think it's control on Windows, as I, while I'm holding it down, as I change the size of my, uh, my, we, my circle of influence, as I like to call it, you see the mask in real time. This is so great because you can really see exactly what you're getting. I love this feature and I hope it comes back to everything, but it's still here. So in here, I can see exactly what I'm going to be affecting. So right now I'm affecting just the leaf. Okay, well, what have I done here? I haven't changed anything in the creative sharpening, but again, it is already at 100 by default. If I look at the creative sharpening slider here, it is also already at 100, which means I haven't actually done anything. I've got a global effect of at 100%, and I've dropped a control point and said, just affect the leaf at 100%. And it's like, okay, I've already affected the whole picture at 100%. The idea here is that I could go into that leaf and I could say, take that leaf and let's sharpen that up to 200%. Or I could say, uh, oops, back, come back here, take that up to 200%. Or I could say, you know what, I want to sharpen that less. Now, in this particular case, you would probably sharpen the leaf more in the background less, but it gives you the choice of how you want to sharpen it. So I could, um, like in this case, I'm sharpening the leaf 200%, sharpening the background at 100%. You can do, you can add multiple control points just like you can in any other tool. So you could say, I want this leaf a little sharper, that one a little less, whatever you want to do. Or you can switch this and you can't do both of these simultaneously it's one or the other you can switch between control points or color ranges now this is another really cool feature that is unique to this tool i can sharpen based off of the color range so i can grab the eyedropper and say i want to sharpen the yellowish in that leaf in there and i'm going to take that up to you know like 200 percent 
and I'm going to grab the color, not that one, I'm going to grab the eyedropper and say the color of this kind of background back here. I'm going to take that down to 0%, and that's the only two that I need, so I'm just going to delete that extra one. So I've taken the leaf color, and I've said, give me that at 200, and the background color, and done that at 0. You go, okay, how do I know what mask is actually, what, what mask I've actually built? When I was in the control points, I could easily see the masks in there, right? How do I see the mask here? Let's go back up to the modes up here, and that's what this is. The effect overlay shows me an overlay view, that you know standard red overlay, or I can go to the mask view, and now I see an actual mask. So now I can go in here and say, oh, okay, well, I, actually, I selected a pretty good range of yellow there that's got all of the leaf, um, but let's go to the one that's negative or, or 0%, and you know I got most of that in there, but there's this other stuff happening in here, so let's do this. Let's add another plus on here and grab the eyedropper, and I'm going to click right on... Well, I didn't do a very good job today. Right on the, let's try that again, um, that kind of darker leaf. I don't even know what that is, but those little sticks in there. And that's what I'm trying to get. I'm doing a pretty bad job of grabbing it. So let me do this. Let's turn off this view, grab this, and I probably should zoom in more. Why don't we do that? That, that would be a very good idea to zoom in to 100%. To do this, here we go. Now I'm going to grab that color there there we go so now that i've got that let's zoom back out and view the mask yeah okay maybe i need to add some more anyway the idea is you go in here and you start adding. oh it's because i it was still at 100 that's why i forgot to bring it down to zero let's get rid of that there we go there we go so now i've selected that range let's try again now let's select there and nope kind of got too close to the original one grab the eyedropper again there there we go now we're starting to isolate it a bit more. So you can see what you're doing here. You are basically adjusting the color and you can go in here even adjust the color this way if you wanted to. Unfortunately, this doesn't update until you let go. But the point is that you can build a mask for your image based off of the colors. So you're sharpening based off of color range and this is how you see the mask in there. All right, so I think most people will probably continue to use the control points, but you have that option in there as well. Okay, um, back into the preferences because there's more in there. In the settings we looked at just the image size sliders there's four other tools in here to look at um, the first one default control point settings this is actually really really important so by default this setting is neutral and i would actually argue that i would change this to retain creative sharpening settings but here's how this works so by neutral what this means and this is the default let me delete this control point let's kind of reset everything here Let's say that I go to my, my global sharpening and I've made a bunch of changes in here, right? So I've made all these changes to my sharpening and that's the way that I want it. Now I grab a control point and I drop it on the leaf. By default, let's, let's expand this out. By default, everything that I've just dropped on here, all these controls are at their default settings. So that means the output sharpening is at 100 and the structure is at zero, the local contrast and the focus are all at zero. That is the default position of these. If, however, we delete that, I go into the settings and I say, no, no. I want the default position to be retaining the creative sharpening settings. What that means is whatever I set up here, when I drop a new control point, it is going to already have all of those settings on it. So effectively what this means is I do my global work the way that I want it, right? To tweak all these sliders to get them the way I want. And then I go, ooh, but I want a little bit less of local contrast on this part of the image. So instead of having to drop a control point and recreate all these settings, I would drop the control point and say, okay, now let's just take that local contrast down a little bit. There we go, it's perfect. I think that's a better way to work, totally up to you. So there's that option in there. The next option is another one that's kind of um, weird to have on its default. The default is default, well, the setting is default control point sliders. So you notice when I drop the control point, there's just one slider and I had to click the triangle to open it up. I don't do that. I wanna say, show me all of them by default. So now whenever I drop a control point, they're all there. All it means is you're not having to click this little triangle. Uh, it's kind of a weird option. I really don't know why it would be there, but anyway, there you go. So I think that that should be set to all. You can also have it say, just use the last control point setting. So only one, the last one uses there. That's super weird. So let's just leave that at all. We're gonna leave this to retain. So that's not the default. I like it better. Leave that to all, not the default. I like it better. Default measurement unit. Is it gonna be inches or centimeters? That's up to you, of course. And then number of inks used. This has to do with the output sharpening for your inkjet printer. What kind of printer are you printing to? Is it a normal four ink printer? 
it is a is it a photo specific a six ink printer or is it a black and white grayscale ink printer Ooh, so you have all these options in here so that matters again as well so very very precise control over here over the amount of sharpening for the type of printer that you're printing to all right so that's all set there we talked about control points we talked about color ranges um duplicate and delete control points that's all standard stuff we've seen before and then the loop it's just a loop okay that's everything in here let me cancel out of this and we're going to open up another picture a different file to have a, a kind of deep education about sharpening but before i do that let me take a look at the questions uh jorge says do you need any special adjustments for sharpening photos taken with a camera that has no low pass filter oh i love these questions so low pass filter when a low pass filter is not on the camera it's you end up with an image that is um sharper so the low pass filter makes the image sharper so if you don't have a low pass filter your picture will already be sharper than one that doesn't if you compare a low pass to a non-low pass filter photo i wouldn't say there's any special sharpening i would use these same sharpening tools that we've got right here to sharpen it just a little bit of that first one would probably kick up the difference in there when you the reason that some cameras um have a low pass filter it used to be that they were all that way right all digital sensors had low pass filters it just made uh, even though it made the image a little bit softer, it made the image look better because there's just a little bit too much kind of digital kind of cringiness that would happen without it. Sensors have gotten a lot, oh, and, sorry, and um, if you don't have a low pass filter, you can risk getting more A. So if you've got any kind of fine pattern uh, in the image, like even the shirt that I'm wearing today, it's very, very fine little lines in it. Side note here, when I bought this shirt, whenever I buy clothing, because I'm on camera a lot, I always pull out my iPhone and I look at the shirt through the camera to see if I can see a moray pattern. If I see a moray pattern show up right away, shirt goes back on the shelf. Um, but you can quite often get moray from fine detail like this if you don't have that high pass, uh, that low pass filter. If you, um, if you don't have that on, then you risk getting the moray, but you get a sharper image. So trade-offs, a lot of digital cameras today now ship without the low pass filter because you do get a sharper image the risk is a little bit of more a but the technology has gotten so good that more almost never shows up it's just it's one of those things that that problem has largely been removed not completely but largely and the preference is to give you a sensor that gives you a, a sharper picture uh if you were let, let's say you buy the new panasonic lumix s1h that is the full frame camera full frame digital camera for the video market Panasonic actually put the low pass filter back onto that camera because that, be, well, first of all, to totally eliminate the possibility, I'm totally to look you know, as much as possible, eliminate the possibility of moray, but also because that ever so slightly softer image actually looks more film like than a pure digital picture. So, a little trivia there. Anyway, moving on. Um, people saying can't see my cursor. Um, I don't know what happened there, but hopefully, okay, it's just lag. Good, good, good. We got that. Okay. Um, how did I get to the settings? Nick said the settings panel was, there was a button on the bottom left that says settings. And depending on where you got to it, you might be able to get to it from a preferences dialog. It just depends on how you open the filter. But that settings button is down in the bottom left corner. Uh, while testing, can you eliminate the speaker's picture taking up a quarter of the screen? That is, you have complete uh, control over the scaling of your image and how you look at it. Um, does low pass e equal anti-aliasing? It is, yes, anti-aliasing filter, that is correct. Okay, moving on. Um, this picture, okay, I created this little image yesterday in Photoshop for you guys. Let me open this into Photoshop itself because it's a little easier for me to control it in here. And let me show you what I've got. What have I made? All right, I created a picture, zoom tool here, zoom into this a bit, where I created a big block and then I created three lines, a one pixel wide, a two pixel wide, and a three pixel wide line. And then I created this grid pattern. This top grid pattern here is one pixel. Each each little tiny um, dot you see on there is a single pixel. And then the same thing here where each one is two pixels. So a one pixel grid, black and white checkerboard. There we go, checkerboard, that's what I was looking for. One pixel checkerboard and a two pixel checkerboard pattern. And then I created three diagonal lines. And these diagonal lines are one, two, and three pixels. And they're at a 45 degree angle. Right now we can see clearly that we are getting pure black, pure white, because there's no diagonal lines. You can't have a diagonal line through here, through a single pixel, right? A pixel is a block. That's just the only choice that you have. 
So when we look at, pan down, pan down, this one pixel wide diagonal line, there's that anti-aliasing that was happening. So that anti-aliasing coming up and there's that little bit of gray. Okay, so that's what I created. Then I duplicated that out, Oops, stop. Duplicated that out three times and I blurred these with the Gaussian blur tool. A 0 0.2 pixel blur, 0 0.4 pixel blur, and a 0 0.6 pixel blur. And if we zoom into these, you'll see this, the one pixel line's got this little bit of graying around it, right? A little bit of graying. And if we look at the grid pattern, you see a little bit of graying happening in there. See that? Go over to the larger blur. Use the navigator to make this a little bit easier. Maybe not. Um, there's a, a bigger blur, right? This is the 0.4 blur. There we go. You can see what's happening there. That's gotten really mushy. And then the 0.6 one, and these lines are super, super soft in here. And that one is basically one big mush. Okay, so I've got these four identical sets of pixels, blurred, well, no blur, and then 0 0.2, 0 0.4, and 0 0.6 blur. Remember when I was explaining how a low resolution camera, or any resolution camera, uh, reaches a limit of its resolution capability, right? That's kind of what we're seeing here. Imagine, if you will, this is a photograph of a perfect, a perfectly beautiful uh, line, diagonal line on a wall. That low resolution camera, this is the best that you're gonna get out of it, right? That's, that's just what happens in there. What sharpening does is it increases the contrast. Remember I talked about that? It's just increasing contrast. It's just localizing it. It's looking for specific edge areas to increase the contrast around. So if I was to increase the contrast of this image right here, what would ultimately happen? Well, if I increase it enough, the black will go back to pure black. You can see here, the black is not pure black. If I actually let's do this, um, can I show where info? Here we go. You can see there, um, if you look at the, let's change this to, can I do this to black and white? Um, grayscale, there we go. That's 90%, right? And let's bring up the eye to make it really clear. That black is 90%, that white is 18%. Let's go to the original one, right? The untouched one, unblurred one. The black is 100%. So we're looking at this readout right here, in case you're wondering what I'm looking at. Look at that readout right there. Black is 100, white is zero. Now, as I pan over, pan, 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 to the slightly, the first slightly blurred one, the black is down to 90, the white's at 18. Go, 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 go. There we go. Black is 61, white is 56. So look at how close they are to each other. Look at the last one here, and it's going to be almost the same colors. The black is now 59%, the white is 58%. They're almost identical, one pixel off. But by increasing the contrast, if I go in here and I increase the contrast, if I go high enough, I will eventually take that black back to 100 and that white back to zero, right? I will restore the black and white original part of this. But we can't just do that to any picture, increase the contrast all the way. It looks terrible. So what sharpening does is it increases the contrast, but it does it in a very localized, very specific way. So now let's try to understand exactly how it does that. So let's go into from here. I'm going to take this picture into... I'm looking knit collection output sharpener. All right, you know, before I start that, let me go back to the questions real quick. Yeah, we are definitely not going to get into an image. Um, uh, your edit command screen is over the blurry one. Oh, can you? Is this you guys see this whole window? I have no idea. Please correct your screen. Have lost the screen. Wait a second. Hold on a second. People tell me I lost the screen. Uh, Okay, that was weird. I mean, you should have seen, yeah, you see Photoshop right now, don't you? Like now you see Photoshop? Okay, I gotta make sure this is going right. Um, Cause I'm, what I'm showing looks right. You see Photoshop now. People say it's locked up, it's fixed now, you see Photoshop. Okay, now you see Photoshop. Jane says you see no Photoshop. Tom sees Photoshop. I don't understand. Okay, you should be looking at Photoshop now. I'm gonna right click on the image in Photoshop. No, I'm not. I'm going to go to the filter menu in Photoshop and choose the output sharpener. And y'all should be seeing now Sharpener Pro, right? That's what you should be seeing. That's what I'm seeing in my output to you. Um, let's make sure that's happening. And it's all good now. It's all good. Everybody sees it. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. He's Sharpener. Yeah, you see it. Okay. Whew. I don't know what happened there, but here we go. So did everybody miss the whole black and white thing? Do I need to repeat that? Okay. Um, do you know, so some people saw everything. Okay. So there must be, no, I don't need to. Okay, good. No, just the very beginning. Well, I don't know what the beginning was. You saw it well. Okay. You guys didn't miss anything. Okay. We're good. There's almost 300 in, of you in here. I'm glad that some of you saw it. For those who didn't, 
I don't know what happened and I'm sorry. Um, I blame go to webinar. Okay, where are we? Back at this, let's see here. We are now looking at this picture at 100%. Let's go side by side here and toggle this. And I'm actually gonna zoom in more. I'm gonna zoom into 300% on here to really see the difference. And let's pan over to the original image. Okay, so we're looking at the original. I wish I could zoom in more than 100%. I can't, but we'll still see what's happening in here. All right, so this original image, remember, has not been blurred, this one right here. And so ignore the diagonal lines for a second. In fact, I'm gonna just hide the diagonal lines from your view. No, I'm not. Ignore the diagonal lines. Look at just the black and white checkerboard and the lines, the vertical lines. If I take the output strength sharpening and I crank it all the way up, we see absolutely nothing happening because we're already at maximum contrast. You can't get any darker than pure black or any brighter than pure white. That's it. So no matter what I do in here, nothing is going to change to this part of the image. Now, if you look at the diagonal lines, we are seeing a change in here, but ignore that for a moment. Now let's go over to 0.2 pixel change and let's reset this back to 100. Okay, so we're back at our default settings. Right here, we are seeing our, this is remember our before over here on the left, we can see some of that gray, but look over here on the right the gray is gone. It has reverted back to where we started. We have de-blurred the image. We have increased the contrast to the point where the black is to black, the white is to white. Look at the vertical lines here. There is no haloing around them. Look at the diagonal lines. The diagonal lines even look really clean. So that bit of sharpening in here has completely erased the blurring that was happening to that image. Kind of cool, right? Let's go over to the number three. This is pretty awful to start with. Look at how blurred this was. But now look on the right, it's still blurred, it's still soft, but it is higher contrast than this is. And if I take my output strength sharpening up, ignore the edges for a second. If I take this up and I keep going up and up and up, I'll get to a point where I can't quite get it all the way to black and white, but look at how much better, look at how much more clear this is to what's happening over here. This is what the sharpening is doing. This is what any of these sharpening tools are doing. They're increasing the contrast. Now, the difference between them, output sharpening versus structure versus local contrast. I said that the output sharpening is an unsharp mask. The unsharp mask name is a bit unfortunate because unsharp makes you think, oh, well, it's unsharpening it. It is looking at the unsharp areas and building a mask between the unsharp areas and the sharp areas and then sharpening the unsharp areas. That's the full meaning of the name unsharp mask. Unsharp mask is a sharpening tool. The way that it works is it separates, it, it defines the difference between these areas are sharp because they're high contrast. These areas are not sharp because they're low contrast. And it's not an on off. Just like any mask that you build in Photoshop, it is shades of gray. You have pure on, pure off, and then something in between. Same thing with the unsharp mask. It is building a mask based off of the sharpness. This is, this we believe is pure sharp, so it doesn't need any effect. This is as blurry as we feel like we can handle, so it's gonna get maximum effect and then everything in between. So that's all the unsharp mask means. It is sharpening, only sharpening the blurry areas. With that knowledge in mind, let's take a look at what's affected over here. As we take this blur, this output strength up and down, Look at how the center part of the image is affected differently than the outside edges. When you get to the outside edges, when I crank this all the way up, you end up getting this very hard line that is actually closer to what we want it to be. It is a, it is looking at the edges between, like if you look at the original, this kind of darkish blurry area here, pure white on the outside and darker gray on the inside. So it sees a much bigger difference here than there is between here. So within the middle, that's some degree of difference, but the difference from here to here is much, much bigger. So it applies the effect much more strongly. The result of that on an image like this is you end up with a artificially stronger sharpening around the edge than you do in the middle. This is normally what you want in normal images. If we think about that leaf photo for a second, you would want the edges between the leaf and the dark background, the yellow leaf and the dark background to have that extra contrast added to it to make that edge look sharper. But if you sharpen the whole leaf that much, the whole leaf would look terrible. So that is what the unsharp mask is doing. Now, the difference between that structure and local contrast is quite simply what areas of the image it is sharpening. Structure is a more, you can see it's affecting the center more. So it is a more global setting. It is looking at the flatter areas, the kind of softer areas more than the edges. And then the local contrast is yet again, even more of a soft area. So basically think of these as less and less edge detection. 
the local contrast is essentially global. That is essentially contrast, universal contrast for the whole thing. Structure, well, okay, let's let's skip from local contrast, the whole thing, to output sharpening up here being just the edges, and then structure being something in between. Now, that is an interpretation of it. There is more to it in the algorithm of what's actually happening, but that is the most kind of general way that I can explain it, and it's easy to see happening here on this image. So that's what that is. So that is that. That is what I want to show you in here. If we look all the way, let's look at the maximum one, maximum blurry one, and let's see if I crank everything up all the way in here, I can, let's see here, uh, see if I can get, I want to see if I can get this back. This one's back to pure black and white. Look at that, the bottom one. I'm trying to see if I can actually get, let's add a control point to this little area here. Let's make that nice and small, see what the mask is. And let's see if I can crank that up even more. All oh, right, no, because it's not aggregating it, so it's just the one, so it's the same as doing it here globally. Um, so I can get it pretty close, but of course I can't get all the way there because at some point you've got too much blur going on. I mean, look at that. But the fact that it went from this to this is pretty remarkable. Okay, ah, that's all that. All right, let me jump into the questions. We got nine minutes left. Um, let's see if there's not more questions. I will open up that leaf photo, but I do believe we're gonna have some more questions here. Robert says, a bit too small of an image to see the sharpening effect on the grid. You can make your window bigger. Um, it's the best that I can do sorry it's it's i can't make my screen any lower resolution unfortunately i can't zoom in less than more than 300 percent but i hope you can see that don says i've been told not to use unsharp on people is there any truth to that statement sure uh to the degree of you will very quickly any sharpening you add to, to a face is going to very quickly start to look bad which is why the localized sharpening is very powerful so with that question let's do this um let me cancel this instead of doing that leaf, why don't I do a person picture? Uh, let's see here, is this picture, is that the one I want? I don't remember now, that one, no, I think this one. Here we go, this one, let me reset the picture. Okay, so here we can see quite sharp around the eyes, right? Oops, it's um, it's actually, this lens is quite a soft lens, like the, the creamy bokeh on this lens is delicious. Um, but if you see the eyelashes in here, they're quite sharp in there. All right, let's do this, let me take this picture and take that into the sharpener and uh, yep there we go and again i have not output this to the right size for print or screen or whatever we're just going to do it at maximum size all right uh, find her eye there it is so let's take the oop, wrong one let's take the global sharpening down because i don't want to apply too much sharpening to her skin so you can see now uh, if I bring that back up, actually, let's just do this. Let's bring it all the way up and you can see what's happening to her skin on there and it starts to look awful, right? We're seeing this weird kind of, pardon me, um, like noise patterns start to emerge and like her nose is starting to look like any, any little bit of imperfect makeup. Um, it's going to start to show up like it looks really kind of bad in there. But if you look around the eyelashes, we're getting some pretty awesome sharpness around the eyelashes in there. So let's do this. Let's take the output sharpening down, add a control point, make it really small really small just onto this area here there we go and now we'll take that output strength sharpening and crank it up so now we're getting that sharpening around the eye but not on the rest of the skin i could add another control point to protect the white of the eye uh there we go make that smaller 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 there we go so i'm adding a control point to protect the white of the eye so we're not getting the weird kind of noisy happening in there um, and you can isolate your sharpening like that. That's where the this becomes really, really handy. So on the skin, very unlikely you'd want to use the unsharp mask. In fact, you can't do this in here, but in Lightroom, you would go into like the texture and do negative texture. Negative texture does great things to faces. So oops, that's uh, that's something you could consider as well. Okay. Um, Christian says, Matt, keystroke for mask on and off. Uh, I don't know. Let's say it might be O, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know offhand. You're going to have to start just just punching them to try. Oh, uh, Carolyn says, please clarify local versus focus. Sorry, I skipped focus. Focus is just another sharpening algorithm that is designed more to look at, uh, designed more to correct images that are actually out of focus as opposed to unsharp because it is exceeded the resolution of the sensor. So it's just a different focus, defocusing 
refocusing, I guess, algorithm. Uh, I can't really explain the science behind it, but it's just a different algorithm to try, specifically for photos that are slightly out of focus. If you, I have this page set up on the manual. If you have the manual, download the manual, you will see in here some explanations. This is page 38 of the user guide. Uh, it explains what output sharpening, structure, local contrast, and focus is, although it's quite generic of a description, but if you want a text version of it and the manufacturer's version of it, that's in here. But I think kind of what I just showed you probably explains a lot more. Uh, Kathy from Alberta, Canada. Sorry to have to, had to miss the beginning. We'll be sending out replays. Oh yeah, I didn't tell you guys that in the beginning. Well, if you had missed it, it wouldn't have mattered. If you miss any part of this, you will get 24 hours after this ends, you will get a copy of this whole webinar in your inbox. There you go.